So let's talk about cravings. I think we all understand, especially if you're fasting, uh, we have cravings for food. And so if you're hungry and you want to get something, what do you do? You get it and you eat it. You want to satisfy that craving, right? Some of us like to go extra trips to the grocery store just to satisfy some cravings, okay? And we can do that. It's really easy to satisfy our hunger, our cravings, our taste buds. And I think we all understand that. Today, this morning, I want to talk about a totally different type of craving. And I want to talk about uh, two specific cravings that have nothing to do with food. They don't have anything to do with your taste buds. They have everything to do with how your Heavenly Father created you. I believe, and there's a verse that tells us this, that every single person in this room has two very specific cravings that every single one of us on a daily basis want God to satisfy in our lives. We, we, we are looking for God to satisfy two very specific and very distinct cravings that we are hoping will be satisfied every single day of our lives. And this is based on one particular verse. So this will be easy today. You can follow today. It's one little verse in the book of Psalms. Now, the cool part about the book of Psalms, it's in the poetic section of the Bible, okay? And the Psalms, there's 150 chapters, and they're basically letters or they're worship songs written by a few different authors to God. And so you have these psalms of praise, and they're essentially praising God for who he is, for what he does, for his character, and, and it's amazing. There's also psalms of lament. And what those are is these are psalms where the author is very honest with God. And some of you in the room, maybe you've wondered, how do I pray to God? Like, what does it really look like for me to reach out to God? How can I speak to him? What can I say? What should I not say? What should I hold back? Like how vulnerable and, and real can I be with my heavenly father? Well, as you read the book of Psalms, King David, one of the authors, he is incredibly vulnerable with God. And he cries out to him in the places in his life where it's hard and where he's confused, where he's even distraught, where he's really hoping for God to provide him with answers. He is so open with God. So if you've ever wondered, how do I pray? You just read the Psalms and you see how you can approach your heavenly father in prayer. And so why do we fast? We fast to satisfy your cravings. Now let's just say that doesn't make any sense at all, right? Why would we give up something to satisfy a craving? And it's because we give up a food because your soul, your heart, your inner self desires something great from God. And so Psalm 37.4 is the verse that lays out your two greatest cravings. Are you ready for this? One verse, Psalm 37.4, and this is what it says says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let me say it again. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now let's look at the two cravings. The first one is before the comma, all right? Delight yourself in the Lord. And so this is one of your cravings, is that in your life, because God created you, and because God wants a relationship with you on an individual basis, he wants you to find delight in him, in who he is. I love the word delight. In the Hebrew, the original language, it's from the word anog, which means to be enamored by someone or something, or to take great pleasure in someone or something. Does that make sense? And so when you and I, seek to delight ourselves in the Lord, you are finding great pleasure in all of who he is. It's why when you just worshiped and we've got this amazing choir, we bring, we're bringing in ringers to make it awesome, right? And we bring them in and we worship and there's just something that you feel that's different, right? When you worship, you feel his presence. You are delighting yourself in the Lord. 
And that experience is different than any other thing you can find in this world. And so that's a craving that you have. Now, let's, let's be honest. How many of us love what comes after the comma, right? Anybody with me? Like, if, if God, if I could tell you, God can provide everything you desire. You walked in this room and I could preach a sermon and then you could go and you could ask God, God, this is what I want. This is what I desire. How many of us would sign up for that? And he gave it to you. I mean, we love that, right? This would be the best church ever, right? We love that. And so in you, you have desires, you have hope, you have dreams, you have certain specific things you want to see happen in your life. And so how good is it that as believers, we have a God who's all powerful, almighty, that gives you access to him on a personal level and you can bring every desire of your heart to him, straight to him. That's a blessing. And so there's a craving deep within you that probably most of your fast has been about as you pray to God, you're asking for God to move. You're asking God to provide. You're hoping that he's going to show up for you in a way that you desperately need him to show up for. And you should do that. In fact, my wife and I right now in our fast, we're praying for something that we're hoping God provides in the summer. We're sowing seeds of prayer now, asking God to provide six months from now for something that we know we need. And so where do we find the ability that we can go to God with any and every desire that we have. Well, it's all through the Bible, but in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is giving a sermon on a mountainside to a large number of people. And chapter 7 is the final part of this sermon, and here's what he says about why you and I can go to God with these cravings. Here's what he says. He says, if you then, though you are evil, don't you love how Jesus can just call his congregation evil and they still follow him? I would never do that to you. You guys are amazing, right? And so he, he says that. He go, he's, he's proven a point. He says, even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. You, you know how to take care of your kids. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What is, what is Jesus saying? You have a God that wants to hear what your desires are. He wants to know what you are desperate for in your life. And you have access to his throne room to speak to him one-on-one, one -on -one, face to face with your heavenly father. And he's also a God that wants to provide for you. Amen. How good is that? That we have a God that wants to be your provider. And so he's teaching these people following him, God is your provider. And you should ask him. You should call on him. You should be in prayer saying, God, here's my need. Here's what I'm hoping for because you're going to the source that can and will provide it for you. And so that's good that he's a provider. Now here's the problem. Sometimes what we do with that verse, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Did you notice there's a progression? And I don't really like the progression, but it goes in a specific order. And the problem happens in our lives when we actually reverse the verse. And a lot of times what we do is we kind of live a little bit in the mindset of we're looking for after the comma. We're just always hoping, God, would you always give and give and give? And so here's what the verse doesn't say. It doesn't say when he gives you the desires of your heart, then you will delight in the Lord. You see that? But isn't it easy knowing that God is this perfect father, this great provider that we've been invited into a relationship with where he wants to give you gifts? Isn't it hard not to make our relationship with God contingent on the fact that we really expect him to provide our desires. It's, it's, I find it hard at times to not reverse the verse that I'm always looking for God to provide. But when he doesn't, what happens? We, we struggle to worship or maybe we struggle to trust. We, we struggle to, to pray and 
we get confused and it throws us off in our life, a lot of times we operate in this way, that when God shows up, oh, then God, then I can delight in you. But that would be reversing the verse. And so the challenge that we face with our two cravings is one craving needs to be higher than the other. There's a, a deeper craving that must be more significant in our life. But this is how we operate sometimes. Sometimes you and I, we crave more from God than we crave more of God. And I want to walk through three dangers that we can find in our lives and in our faith if that's how we operate. All right? Here's the first one. Here's, here's what it is. When we crave more from God rather than more of God... We delight in the gifts instead of the giver of those gifts. You see, this is hard because when it comes to family and work and jobs and, and money and provision, we need the gifts. We want to provide. We want life to move forward in, in the way that we've planned and dreamed of. And the problem is it doesn't always work out that way. And the problem becomes that we start to realize the gifts are not really the greatest satisfaction of our lives. And God wants to make sure where your heart is. In our relationship with him, what he values the most is where your heart is. What do you delight in more, the giver or the gifts that come from the giver? And I've learned in my life, the more I start to delight in the gifts, I really start to miss out on the giver of those gifts. And I think God knows that. And I think God sees that if we get too heart tied to the gifts. Let me illustrate this. There's a story in John chapter six. And in John, there's, John unpacks seven miracles of Jesus. And one of those was the feeding of the 5,000. How many have heard of that story? So Jesus takes the fish, the loaves, feeds 5,000 plus people in this place and they have 12 basketfuls left over. It's an incredible miracle. And so he ends up, after that happens, the disciples and Jesus cross over the lake. They go to the other side. Well, the people that he was ministering to, that he fed, they're like, hey, where'd the guy go that gave out free dinner, all right? And they're like, hey, let's go find him. We want more bread. We want more food. If we're on this journey, we need him to keep feeding us. He's like that miracle worker. And so they go across the lake and they find Jesus. And Jesus speaks directly into them about what they're looking for because they've reversed the verse. They have a greater craving for the gift rather than the giver. And here's what Jesus says to them. He answered them, Truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. And what is Jesus saying? You're coming to me for bread that's going to satisfy you for a couple of hours, and you're missing out on the bread of life, which is me. He's going, don't, don't follow me just for the gifts and all these temporary blessings, and if you hang your heart and your hat and your life on the temporary blessings, you're gonna miss out on your greatest craving, which is Jesus himself. Do you see that? And so he's saying, it's good to get the bread, but those gifts were meant to draw you into me. And he goes on to say, I am the bread of life. I am your ultimate satisfaction. Don't miss out on satisfying your greatest craving. And so for us, what do we delight ourselves in more? Is it the gifts we're always asking God for? Or is it simply God himself that we delight in? Here's the second challenge. I don't know if you've seen this before in your life, but sometimes our blessings may become burdens. Now what, is, now what does that mean? Well, let, me, let me tell you a story. So I've mentioned before I have four children, okay, six and under. Please continue to pray for us, all right? <laughs> and three girls, six, now five and three, and we have a baby boy. And so there was a time where we lived in a 1,000 square foot, two uh, bedroom condo, and we 
just had our third daughter, okay? So we had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn baby. And Heather and I moved into the smaller bedroom to fit the three girls in the master bedroom, okay? And this isn't in the baby books. You, I guess you don't put a, a baby next to a two and three-year-old to sleep. I don't know. We didn't read that in the manual, okay? But that's just what we had to do. And so we're in this situation. There's a lot of memories in that place and also a lot of tears. It was a great time. But there, there was this funny thing that happened. Our Paisley, our two-year-old at the time, she was the younger sister. And she was fired up to be a big sister, you know? No longer will she just be ordered around by her big sister. Now she gets to order someone else around, I guess. And, and I remember she was looking at Heather's belly and speaking to Skylar and praying for her and all these cute things like this sweet little child's gonna come out and I'm gonna love her and it's gonna be beautiful, right? How many of you know that doesn't really happen that well? So Skylar's born and it's all good. And it's maybe two weeks into them sharing a room. We have a two week old sleeping with these kids. And I don't know about you, but do you have a family member that if you wake them up at the wrong time of night, they turn into like Godzilla, you know what I mean? And it's like, step away, like don't talk anymore, get out of there. Don't look at your spouse next to you, all right? So, so the baby starts crying and it's like midnight and we didn't get there in time, and Paisley is woken up by the cries of the baby, all right? And here's what she says. She stands up in her crib. She's so angry. She goes, Mom, come get your baby. Come get your baby. She's just yelling. It's not like, come get my sister. It's your baby, you know? She's totally dismissed her cute little sister. This is two weeks in. They've struggled for five years, all right? And oh man, she's just, the shine wore off quickly of this sweet little baby, right? And what does that tell us? Some of the things that we receive as blessings don't fully satisfy us in our life. And you've, you've maybe seen this, right? No marriage is perfect. We crave the marriage, but the marriage is never going to be perfect. We crave to have children. How many challenges come with having children? We craved a new job. God gave it to us. It's a blessing. But then it's not as perfect as we hoped it would be. The new house, there's problems with the new house. And so the beauty of it is God is blessing us. And we call on him for his blessings. And his blessings are good. But the challenge becomes, the blessings become burdens when we overvalue the blessings and not the blesser. And so they become weights to us because we're looking for satisfaction in temporary blessings when there is a greater craving in your life. Some of those things wear off and we're always craving more blessings and that's good. You should always pray for that. But God is your ultimate, ultimate blessing. And so where does that leave us? Well, if we crave more from God rather than more of God, we're left with our cravings aren't fully satisfied. And so we're in the middle of this fast, and I really want to go beyond that. This is, this is a game changer in your prayer life. Yes, I want you to end the fast well, but what about your prayer life for 2020? Will you be willing to pray, not just more from God in your life, but what would it look like for you to pray for more of God in your life? How would that change your year? How would that impact the way you see God? What would God do if that was your greatest prayer to satisfy the greatest craving of your life, to delight yourself in him? Well, here's what I think would happen if we craved more of God beyond everything else. Here's what would happen. Delight yourself in the Lord. We would delight in the giver regardless of the gifts. Because what happens when God doesn't give you the desires of your heart? Where do we go? How do we respond? Can we still find ourselves worshiping our heavenly father even when he doesn't answer your prayer? Even when his timing doesn't look like your timing, can we still delight in the giver of the gifts we so desperately want? And so what God desires is that no matter what your outside circumstance looks like, you would crave his presence in your life. 
you would crave his peace in your life. Even in the midst of your outward circumstances, not going the way you'd like, inwardly, in your heart, you can find peace simply because you delight in the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I am, your heavenly Father. That's what you and I have at our disposal. And you'll notice the more you crave God, the desires of your heart will become for more of God. Why? Taste and see that the Lord is good. The more you taste of him, the more you desire of him. So regardless of what you go through, you can still find yourself worship, worshiping him. Secondly, here's what can happen, is now your burdens can actually become your what? Your blessings. And what does that mean? Well, there's this story in, in uh, the Gospels. There's a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And the story tells us she's been reaching out to doctors. She's been spending all kinds of money trying to find out the solution, trying to find healing in her life. She's gone everywhere and nothing is working. She can't figure it out. Nothing's helping her overcome. She cannot find healing. And in this story, Jesus is kind of walking through her town. And someone else has come to Jesus and they've told him, I need you to come heal someone in my life. I need you to come with me. And so he's actually on his way to heal someone else. And he's walking through this, this town. There's people everywhere, the Bible says, and they're, they're crashing into Jesus. They're huddling up with him. And he, he's kind of this, I mean, this amazing figure that people want to see. They don't want him to leave. And she has this moment. She's been carrying this burden for 12 years. She doesn't have the answers. She doesn't know how to overcome it and, and be healed. And she has a moment where she has to decide, Jesus is right in front of me. Will I fight to be in his presence or will I miss out on this opportunity? You see that? He's just walking right across of her. And so something in her just compels her to fight through the crowd. By the way, because she's bleeding, she's not supposed to touch anyone, let alone a prophet, a leader in the Jewish community, not supposed to even touch him or even talk to him. She fights through the crowd. She gets up behind Jesus and she just grabs the edge of his cloak, just barely, doesn't touch his body, just touches the edge of his cloak. Now, mind you, all kinds of people are touching Jesus. But I want you to see what happens when this woman just touches his cloak in faith, fights to be in his presence amongst the hardest situation she's faced in her whole life for 12 years. Look at what happens. Jesus stopped and he said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Now that's interesting because everyone's touching him. What's the difference? She touched him in faith. She knew Jesus himself in his presence, this person, this man being close to him will provide what I desperately need. Do you see that? She had to find herself in his presence. And I love what this says, because I want to be a person that has a faith that stops Jesus in his tracks. He's going to heal someone else. She approaches him in faith and he stops and he says, power has come out from me to someone else. He says, who is that that did it? She, she timidly fesses up, it was me. She's kind of scared, am I in trouble? What's gonna happen? L look at what else he says. He says, daughter, back to that fatherhood. He's your heavenly father who loves you. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in what? Peace. Peace. Do you see what happened? When you find yourself in the presence of God, you unlock the door to the power of God. And when you experience the power of God in his presence, you leave in peace. Amen? That's what God wants to provide. And so he wants to give you gifts, but I don't know what burdens you carry, but God can turn them into blessings because he wants you to experience his presence. And when you experience the power of God in his presence, you will walk away with the peace that this world and no blessing and no provision that this world has to offer can provide to you. It's different. It's better. It's life changing. In a moment of Jesus's presence, this woman's greatest craving in her life 
completely healed in his presence with faith. And some of you have that testimony. You've walked through all kinds of challenges. You've walked through divorce. You've walked through loss. You've walked through job loss. You've walked through challenges with your children. And you continue to find yourself right here worshiping your Savior. And God is working in you because you know there is nothing better than the presence of God. That is your greatest craving. And he'll use you as you continue to crave more of him. And where does that lead us? Well, that leads us that, to this place where your greatest craving is satisfied. So, you know, I, t I talk about my children a lot because they give me a lot of stories, let's be honest, all right? And a big part of our story is before we had any children, our first pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And I think I was 24, Heather may have been 23, 24 years old, and we just, we just were not at all prepared for that type of feeling, you know? It's common in the world, unfortunately, but to us, it was so uncommon. And the sense of loss, and the sense of, of just sitting back and receiving that and going, God didn't give me the desires of my heart. My wife was desperate to have children and to start a family, and God just didn't provide it in the way we expected. And it was a gut check to our faith at that time in our life. And so it, it left us in this place, how, how am I going to respond when God doesn't show up the way I've asked him to? When he's not meeting the desires of our hearts, how do we respond? I'll never forget, we got home from the hospital. It was like the next day, my wife's just crying. As a husband, I had no answers. I was helpless. I couldn't do anything to fix it. We just had to walk through it together. And I, I didn't know what to do. My wife goes on the other side of our bed in that small, small bedroom, and she looks out the window, and she sits on the floor, and she just cried. She cried, and she prayed. And I'm in the other room and I just start to pray. And I just start to ask God to come into our circumstance and to give us what we most desperately need, which is Him. God, we need your peace. I need you to help my wife. I need you to help her come out of this. And I don't even know how to describe it, but God showed up in ways that were so profound in this burden we were walking through and had no idea how to, how to handle, his presence came onto my wife in such an amazing way. Somehow she's finding joy in the midst of that circumstance. She's finding her way, reading the word and seeking God in the midst of that. And God showed up in our tiny little condo. And you know what he did? He didn't give us the desire of our heart to have a child in that moment, but he gave us more of himself. And you know what that did for our faith? We just saw God in this beautiful way, that he is good even when life is hard, that he loves us even though our desires weren't met. And church, he wants that for you, but you can't reverse the verse. Yes, we ask for more of God, but it may not come. We ask for more from him. It may not come the way you want it to. Why? Because he wants you to know your greatest craving is more of God. And for 2020, I pray that every single one of us, that is our first desire. God, I, all these things I wanna ask for, but first, I want more of your presence and I want more of your power and I want to experience more of your peace and everything else will come next. So let's stand and have the prayer partners come forward as we close this morning. You may ask, well, how do we do that? How do we crave and receive more of God? Well, you heard a few things earlier. Maybe for you it's a connect group. Maybe you need community with people praying over you, people 
just diving into your burdens and your struggles with you, drawing you closer to your heavenly father. Don't take this journey alone. Maybe you need community around you. Maybe in 2020, you just need to find yourself in this room far more often, experiencing what it feels like to worship your heavenly father. Maybe it's digging more into the word. Maybe your prayer life will look a little bit different this year as you crave more of him. And what I wanna to do to close is, is if, if you have that desire that you truly want more of God in your life, why don't you bow your heads? Let's close our eyes as we pray. Why don't you just lift one of your hands if you wanna receive that. If you want more of God in your life with your eyes closed, you're just saying outwardly, God, I want this. And Father, we come before you. You've given us these cravings. And yes, you are a good father. You know how to give good gifts to your children. And God, we pray for those gifts. We fast for those gifts. But God, first and foremost, our greatest craving is more of you. There's nothing better than when you come from heaven to earth and we feel the presence of the perfect almighty God in our lives. And so God, for every hand raised, we pray more of God, that they would feel more of your presence in their life, that they would receive more of you and that they would experience a peace that only can come from you. We worship you this morning. We thank you that you are our heavenly father. We thank you that Jesus is our Lord and savior. Guide us by your spirit this week. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. Hi, thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the message. If our church has impacted you in any way and you feel led to give, you can go to harborsidechurch.org give or text Harborside to 77977. Thank you and have a good day.